Well, how's everybody doing today? I am so glad that you're here. Are you ready to rock this thing? All right. Yeah, let's get weird. Okay, so here we go. Here we go. How many, uh, how many parents are in the room today? How many parents? Parents all over the place? Uh, here's something that I know about you. Here's what I know about you. You want to give what is good to your kids. Is that true? You, you want to give them the very best that you can. And as a matter of fact, listen, I not only know this about you, but God says this about you. God says this is true. In the scripture, Jesus is speaking in the book of Matthew chapter seven. He says it like this. Listen, he says, if you parents, then though you are evil, pause real quick. He says, though you don't get it all right, though you're not the perfect parent, any, any perfect parents in the room? Okay, I didn't think so. Uh, but he says, though you screw it up. He says, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask of him? Amen? See, listen, this is what I know, that you want to give your very best uh, to, to your kids. And we have really, really, really good intentions, uh, but it's not easy. How many of you know that parenting is not easy? Anybody, you know this already? Uh, parenting has always been hard. It's always, always been a difficult thing. It's never, ever been easier. But I would say this, that now more than ever, uh, there are so many forces trying to pull your child away from you, and not only from you, but from all that is good in this world. I, I know this to be true. There are so many corrupting forces and influences that seek to degrade their soul, to ruin their soul, um, to, de to destroy them. And, and listen, they are nefarious. They, they are coming against you and your family, and you know this. It is not easy to be a parent today. This is why... Uh, that the stakes are sky high with parenting, and now more than ever, we got to get it right. Even though we always haven't gotten it right, come on, we have to get it right. Anybody love their kids? You have to get it right then, right? And the problem is when they came, they didn't come with an owner's manual. Like, hey, here's what you do and everything will be fine, right? It doesn't quite work that way. We got to figure some things out because failure uh, is not an option when it comes to our kids. And it's not an option when it comes to our parenting. Do you agree? We've got, to, we've got to do this and do this well. So I think it might be time that we get into a little bit of weird parenting. Weird parenting, okay? Because this is such an important issue for all of us. And uh, we've been in this series called Weird. How many have been here for part of this series? Anybody at all? Uh, you know, we've been talking about the idea that Jesus put in front of us. He, he puts it in front of you. He says, uh, there are two roads. Anybody remember this? He says, one road is broad and a whole bunch of people travel down that road. It's easy to go down that road. It's like Go with the crowd, just go with the flow, you know, whatever they believe, you believe. Jesus said, this road's really, really easy to travel. Anybody know this? Yeah, it is easy to travel. And he says, but that, the problem with that road is that it leads to destructive things. It, it leads to a soul destruction. And let me just tell you something. If you live long enough, you will figure it out. That, that what this world keeps selling you will never fill your soul. It just won't. Uh, but Jesus said there's a different option. He says that there's this really narrow road. It's a hard road. It's a weird road. It's a difficult road. Not very many people go on this road. Uh, matter of fact, you're, you're weird if you choose this direction. But he says this direction, listen, it's better. It's good. And he says this direction, this road, it leads to life. A amen? Anybody know what I'm talking about? It leads to a different kind of life. And, and we said that we've got to get weird because normal isn't working anymore. Like you just look around. What is normal is addiction. What is normal is anxiety. What is normal is, is being broke. What is normal is depression. Normal is feeling overwhelmed. Normal, listen to me, is not working. We need something different. We need a little bit of weirdness, amen? So let's talk about weird parenting because it's a really important thing that we get right. Uh, so how many of you, again, are parents in the room? Parents in the room? Parents in the room? Okay. Uh, how many parents would say today that parenting has been single-handedly the hardest thing that you've ever done in your life. Now listen, yeah, for me, no, no doubt about it. Listen, I love it, and I love it still, even at my age. I love being a parent, but I will tell you, it is the single hardest thing I have ever done. And because it's so hard, I think people are always looking for, for help. We're, we're always looking for tips, and culture is never short on giving you tips about how to, how to parent. But the problem is, listen, uh, I would lovingly call lovingly, did, did I say lovingly? Okay, lovingly call uh, the, the kind of cultural tips that we get about parenting stupid and inept. What? You're so rude. No, I'm, I'm just looking around at the result and it doesn't work. There, there has to be something better. There has to be something different than what we're getting. Uh, so 
If you've been paying attention at all to parenting, every year or so, there's a new trend that arises. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, now, if you go back in history, this wasn't true. Like, if you go back 50 or 60 years, uh, there wasn't this new method of parenting, this new trend of parenting every time you turn around. Guess what there was? There was just parenting. Like, if you were to go back to your granddaddy or your great-granddaddy and you were to go, hey, Grandpa, just kind of thinking about this, I'm wondering, are you a conscious parent? Are you a helicopter parent? Are you a positive parent? Are you a free, or, or are you a free range parent? Your granddaddy would look at you and go, are you stupid? Like, what? like and they might take their belt off and, right? Correct you, right? I mean, come on. Um, but in recent decades, thanks to the world of psychology, uh, there is like a new trend every single month and it's more complicated than ever, to, according to them, to be a parent. Like there are all these strategies and I just think, I'm just gonna say it, I think all these strategies are just creating a world where your child is dysfunctional, needy, and entitled. Did I just say that in church? I, I think we need to create something better, amen? I, I just do. Uh, I was listening to this guy, uh, and I almost hesitate to say this in church, but I listened to this guy named Matt Walsh. He's a very, he, he's, He's a pretty controversial guy a lot, but I got to admit, your pastor likes a lot of what he says. Uh, but he's this podcaster guy, and he was talking about all these parental trends that are going on in culture. And uh, he, w he was talking about the newest rage in, in parenting techniques, and, and it was trending on, on guess where? It was trending on TikTok. And that's where we get all our wisdom for life is, is TikTok, right? Uh, but this trend is called gentle parenting. Have you heard of this? And I looked this up. It's everywhere. It's crazy. Like people are like really into this. And so I go, what's gentle parenting? I have no idea what's gentle parenting. So I went to this thing called parents.com and they have this uh, section on there that talks about gentle parenting, kind of describing what it is. And what's interesting is I came across some information that says uh, the, the Children's Hospital in Chicago did a major uh, study and uh, among millennial aged parents. And basically they concluded that 75% of millennial age parents buy into what I'm gonna share with you called gentle parenting, okay? And so on parents.com, uh, they have this definition, this explainer of, of gentle parenting to help us out. Here's what they say, I'm just gonna quote it for you. It says, uh, gentle parenting is a peaceful, positive style of parenting that is different, very different from the previous generations of parents. I just wanna pause right there. That could be the whole problem, okay? That, that just could be the whole problem. Uh, I'm just gonna read uh, Matt Walsh's response that I found about general parenting, okay? Can I, can I just read this to you? I'm just gonna quote him, okay? He says, I'm not saying, quote, I'm not saying that we should parent exactly as our parents or grandparents did. I'm not saying our pr the previous generations of parents didn't make mistakes. I'm not saying that they were perfect, but, but previous generations of parents did parent the people who built human civilization. Then he goes on. They parented the pioneers, the poets, the philosophers, the artists, the inventors, the warriors, and the leaders that accomplished incomprehensible feats of heroism and genius and who gave us every good and wonderful and beautiful thing that we have in our lives today. He goes on to say, so old-fashioned old parents, or parenting, we might call it, has a decent track record. Uh, it's the parent... It's, it's old-fashioned parenting that took us from mud huts to the moon. And then he says this in his very uh, controversial, typical style. He, he says this. He says, and what has modern parenting produced? Does it have a similar track record of success as old-fashioned parenting? Or, or, he says, has it instead produced multiple generations of depressed, lazy, overgrown brats stuck in a perpetual state of emotional and mental adolescence? Now... Uh, I'll let you kind of figure out the, your answer to that. It's up to you. Uh, but the, the, there is a question here. Is our approach to parenting that you see in the world today, now, the, just for you personally, like, is it producing what you see in the world? Is it producing the kind of children that you want to see produced? Is it, is it producing the kind of world that we want to see produced? That's, that's really the question. Uh, you gotta figure that out for yourself. By the way, uh, parenting.com, it goes on to say this. You ready? This is how they explain gentle parenting. 
Be ready, okay? I want to put it up on the screen. This is a quote right off their website. Gentle parenting is a means of parenting without shame, blame, or punishment. It's centered on a partnership as both parents and children have a say in this collaborative style of parenting where parents do not compel children to behave by means of punishment or control, uh, but rather use connection, communication, and other democratic methods to make decisions. Shh quiet to make decisions together as a family. Now listen, this expert who wrote this was a, a, a lady named uh, Daniel Sullivan, and she considers herself a gentle parenting coach. I, I never heard of these coaches. Uh, so, but she goes on to finish it like this. This, unbelievable. listen, she says, gentle parenting teaches children that they can be active in the world. I'm okay with that. Okay, but then she says, gentle parenting... <laughs> teaches children that they can set their own boundaries, trust their own needs, and make their own voices heard. Okay, now listen, listen. I, any old-fashioned parents in the room? Any old-fashioned, old school? Okay, now listen. Have you seen a five-year-old? Okay, can you trust a five-year-old to set their own boundaries, to set their own heart's desires? Listen, I, when I was 10, like, what I felt my needs were and what my boundaries were was I wanted ice cream all the time and I wanted to stay up all night playing that Frogger game. Do you remember we had Frogger? Like, glory to God, like, that was my need, right? Uh, so how well is it going to go if you let a child determine their needs and their boundaries? Come on, just how well is it going to go? My guess, and it's just a guess, but my guess is probably not very well, right? Um, now, now listen, uh, a democratic method of parenting uh, in your home is a recipe for disaster and chaos. I promise you, it is. Listen, 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 listen. As the father and head of my household, uh, I am not presiding over a democracy. I am in charge, period, right? And even if my kids vote me off the parenting roll, <laughs> I'm still in charge, right? This is not a democracy. Uh, so uh, parenting isn't easy, can we all agree? And yes, we want our kids to be happy. Can we all agree? Yeah, we want them to be happy. We don't want them to be miserable. Uh, but way more than happy. Listen, our world and American culture, listen to me, it bows at the altar of happiness. I want my kids to be happy, but way more than happy, I want my kids to be good. Way more than happy, I want my kids to be well prepared for life. Amen? And way more than happy, listen, I want them to know and love the God of the Bible. Because listen, because he is their father in heaven who loves them way more than their earthly father. And he is their father in heaven, listen, who will never hurt them or let them down. Their earthly father, me, I will let my kids down. But if I can get them to love their father in heaven with all of their heart, soul, and strength, I will have done my job. Amen? 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 Come on. So I, I think... What we do because we're obsessed with happiness is we try to give our kids everything. We try to give them the best experiences, the best fashion, the best clothes, the best technology, the best car, the best this, the best that. Like we try to give them everything to make them happy. But, but really, listen, uh, we have the best of intentions, but what if those intentions were misplaced? What if we're actually going about it maybe the wrong way? Maybe what if we are giving uh, our kids some things that actually hurt them in the long run? I think we should figure this out. I think we should talk about this because I think what you see in parenting, just in normal parenting, just isn't working. It's, it's just not working. We got to think this through a little bit deeper. Uh, and by the way, I just want to remind you that we're, uh, as, as a series is called Weird Because Normal Isn't Working, I got the whole idea. I always want to give credit to people when I, when I get good ideas from people. Uh, Craig Rochelle, Pastor Craig Rochelle, he's out of Oklahoma. He wrote this book. I would just highly encourage you to get the book. It is just, it covers a lot of these ideas. We're, of course, expanding on it, but it covers a lot of these ideas that we're talking about in this series. Are we good with that? Just want to give credit for that. Okay. Uh, so what do we do uh, that can actually hurt our kids? and you may want to take notes on this. Here's the first thing, is we give them things that they did not earn. We give them things that they did not earn. Well, you saying they got to earn their food? No, no, you're the parent. You feed your kid, okay? Uh, you clothe your kid. You take care of their needs. Can we all agree? Yes. Okay, now listen. As parents, can we all agree it's even okay to give your kids just gifts? Yeah, of course. Small and little and big and everything in between. It's okay. I, I, I enjoy giving my kids gifts. But, but there's a point where we've got to get them to figure out how to earn it in this life. Can we all agree with that? 
Yes, yes. Um, and so this starts at a very young age where we give our kids what they don't deserve. So here it is, like you're in the grocery store. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And uh, very early on, they figure out they want candy, they want toys, they want this, and they start acting all crazy. And, uh, and, they're, and they're screaming and yelling and you're going, ah, would you just, would you just, and then the pe people are looking at you like you're a bad parent because you are a bad parent. And, and like you're, they're out of control and you're not controlling the situation. And then all of a sudden you go, here, take the candy. Here, take the toy. Just stop crying about it. Just stop yelling about it. Stop acting the fool. But you played the fool by giving them what they act the fool for because they did not deserve it. Amen? I remember a true story. One time, one time we were in a store. Uh, I had my two younger boys in the cart. Uh, they were probably, I don't know, maybe two or four. And my daughter was around six or seven. And uh, she's standing next to me. And we're at Kroger's and we're doing it. And my kids were just losing it, man. And they were just, I want this. They were grabbing the candy and all that. I want this. Give me this. And my daughter, honest to God, she just turns toward the boys and she says, boys, has mom or dad ever, ever, ever bought us anything by screaming and yelling and crying about it. And the boys looked and they go, nope. <laughs> they put it back and she says, now act better. You know, and I'm like, yes, yes, you know. So we do this though, like uh, they, they want something and we reinforce their poor behavior by giving them what they did not earn. Am I right? Uh, and then society reinforces this entitlement attitude all the way through. And then eventually, even in adulthood, listen, I don't want to offend anybody, but we got a whole bunch of people that expect something for nothing. We got a whole bunch of people who expect those who work to give it to those who don't for free. Okay, and then somewhere along the way, we've created this condition. I'm just saying that, yes? Okay. Um, and, and so with every step along the way, like participation, we, we reward it. And, and it's not wise. I, I hate to be the old guy with a bad attitude and, but I am old school, and when it comes to participation, when you give your kid a participation trophy just because they showed up, it's giving them the entitlement mentality. It, it, oh, you're such a terrible human being. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just saying, listen, we, we, should, we should probably never reward people just for doing their duty. We should never reward people just for showing up. We should never reward just for somebody getting out of bed because that's sort of the baseline in life. Yes? We, we should reward something that, that's greater, right? Um, and, and so, friends, listen. I, I think by rewarding the things that they did not earn, we, we actually give our children, what we, we, get, we miss giving our children what we ought to give them. And here's what we ought to give them. Give our children the blessing of earning the blessing. Give our children the blessing of earning the blessing. True, true story, my, my son was uh, into baseball. My youngest son, Isaac, he really loves baseball. And a few years back, like when he was a kid, uh, he played on a team that was really bad. They didn't win anything. It was horrible. And then you go to the little ceremony. Everybody know what I'm talking about? And they gave every kid an, a trophy. Okay, listen. They gave every kid a trophy. They called it a participation trophy. And, and on this trophy, it literally said, I tried. Okay? <laughs> I tried. And uh, my son, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 years old at the time, uh, he looks at this thing and he finds the nearest garbage can and he throws it away and he does, he, we didn't earn this, we sucked. And, uh, and, and I got, okay, listen, call me a bad parent, but I was like, yes, that's my boy. Yes, that he can do better than that, right? Because a little sting makes him want to be better, amen? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, so you might think I'm a bad parent right now, but I don't really care. Uh, because why? I want to teach my children the blessing of earning their blessings. Uh, when my kids were younger, they would do what every kid would do. It's my room. You can't tell me what to do with my room. You can't tell me what to do with my bike or my toys or my phone or my, my, my whatever. And I'm like, your, your, what? Your, your stuff? Like, I just got to remind you, you don't own anything. I own everything that you walk around, that you touch. Every single thing that in your life, I own. And when you start paying the mortgage, the gas, the electric, the insurance, the water, the maintenance, when you buy the furniture you sleep on, then you can decide what to do with it, right? And, and, I'm, and listen, because why? Um, be, because I want to give my kids the blessing of earning the blessing. You hear what I'm saying? Now, listen, uh, we made our kids buy their own cars. Uh, we helped a little bit because it's, it's hard to start off. We helped a little bit, um, but they bought it because I wanted them to feel the pride of owning something and buying it for themselves. Does that make sense? You guys with me on this? Um, 
I understand the kids are going to say, oh, that's not fair, and you're so mean, Pastor Jay. I hope my parents don't listen to you. You know, <laughs> but listen, your job as a parent is not to buy your kids affection. Your job as a parent is to prepare them for life. And I'm going to give you a little heads up, uh, young people. It's something that it's, us old people have figured out. Life is hard. Life will beat you into the ground if you're not ready for it. And you got to man up or woman up, and you got to know how to tackle this life. Amen? And, and it's our job as parents to create a different mindset, not a mindset of entitlement, but a mindset, listen, of worth, worth, work ethic and gratefulness. That's what we need to create in our kids. Amen? And, and so uh, the first mistake I think we do is that we, we give them stuff that they did not earn. And here's the second thing, if you're going to be taking notes, and you're not going to like me for this one at all. Um, but I really think that we give them praise that they don't deserve. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't be gentle with your kids and, you know, try to lift them up. Of course, we want to build their self-confidence. Amen? We, we want to build their self-confidence. Uh, but here's the problem. We, we want to do this, but we love them so much. Uh, we go around from the time they are born going, you are, the, you are the cutest. You are the smartest. You are the best. You're the most talented. He hasn't even said a word yet. <laughs> like, like, and we're doing, I, I find myself doing this with my grandson. You are the best thing in the whole world. Like, this is amazing, you know? And, and what do we do? We spend the next five years, 10 years. You are the smartest. You are the best. You are the greatest. You can do anything. You're amazing. You're clearly number one in the whole world. And we go on and on. And all of a sudden, here's what happens. They walk out our little door and they try life. And they figure out that life has a lot of competition. And they don't always win. That they're not the brightest. They're not the best. They're not the smartest. Listen, at anything. And now what have you done? But mom said I was the best and I deserved to be on the team. <laughs> no, kid, you can't catch a ground ball. Right? right? Am I right? Listen, and what have we done? We've actually set our kid up for failure. And so maybe we should have a different approach. Maybe we, we shouldn't give them praise that they, that they don't deserve. Maybe it's better to praise the process they're in rather than them all the time as a person. Here's what I mean by this. Of course you should say, man, son, you're, you're looking good, man. You're a handsome kid. Of course, I'm, yeah. But, but maybe we should take a different approach. And, and when they get an A in, in school, instead of going, I knew it, you were the smartest and the best ever since you were one year old, I knew it. You know, how about you say, you know what? You worked really hard on that. I'm so proud of you. I mean, I just saw the way you buckled down, you studied, and you went overboard, and, and you did the extra work there. And look at, look at the payoff now for you. You're well on your way, man. Fifth grade is going to be easy for you because you've nailed it in fourth grade. You keep working hard, and you're going to have life. You're going to have life, man. Or when a kid, you know, does well in sports, and, you know, and he's kicking it, and he's doing great. And, and yes, he was even the best that day, right, on the field. You, and I knew you're going to the pros, son. Listen. Here, parent in the room, probably not. Probably not, okay, probably not. The reality is he did really well that day. And here's maybe what we should do. We should say, man, so I told you that hard work was gonna pay off. You, all those extra push-ups, all the time in the gym, all those time doing sprints, all those extra grounders you took. Dude, you're killing it, way to go. Listen, you keep up that hustle, you're, you might go somewhere in this life. You keep that hustle up, you might go somewhere. You keep that work ethic up, you might go somewhere, amen? Now, wouldn't that be a little bit, Maybe better, wiser along the way. I, I think maybe we, we need to think a, a little bit different. So the first thing is we don't want to give them things that they didn't earn. We don't want to create a, uh, 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 an entitlement mindset. And we don't want to give them praise that they don't deserve So to build some sort of false confidence in their life. We want to do something different. And here's the third thing. is We, we ought not to give them freedoms that they cannot handle. We, we ought not to give our kids freedoms that they cannot handle. We think it's gentle parenting. Well, they voted on it. Probably not a good vote, right? Uh, so, like, when, when they're little, we have to protect them all the way through, right? We, we have to. You're, you're, you're wising up, and you're kind of going, oh, my gosh, she can't walk alone. you got to watch her and all this kind of stuff. But as they get older, you got to figure out how to give them the appropriate freedom. But here's what we do. They're 12 years old. You cannot let our son go across that road by himself. This is my wife. Right? She's going, honey, he's 12 years old. He's fine. But, but, but listen, so we go, we're overprotective in one sense. But then we go, you're 12 now. Here's a cell phone that gets you access to the whole world. Go ahead. Have fun. Right? 
So, so maybe we ought not to give them freedoms inappropriately. Maybe we ought to rethink this a little bit wiser. Amen? We ought to think this a little bit dif different. So we give our middle school this device that we call a cell phone, and we say, good luck. I hope you don't get addicted to porn. Uh, good luck. I hope you don't have FOMO, fear of missing out. Good luck, I hope you don't become anxious and full of anxiety like most teenagers are. Somewhere near 40% are in some sort of anti-anxiety pill. You don't think it has anything to do with this? You're crazy. You're just, you're crazy. Maybe you need to be on a pill. I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but listen, listen, I shouldn't say these things. My wife tells me, don't say that stuff. Okay, but listen. Uh, but you know, you're, you look at the culture around, kids are isolated, they're alone, they don't know how to make friends, and you start them off on a phone when they're 12 years old. What, what are you thinking? Seriously, like, well, I hope those kids don't start sexing you. Parent, you gotta, you gotta give age-appropriate freedoms, right? Amen? We gotta figure this out. See, the goal is that we take dependence on us and we move it toward thoughtful dependence on God. That's the goal, is less of you, more of God. And it's up to the parent to take steps along the way to figure out what's appropriate along the way. Amen? But don't give them freedom that they can't handle. That's stupid. It's not wise. Amen? So let's let the Scripture teach us. You willing to let the Scripture teach us today? Here's what the Word of God says. It's a passage that we've read over and over. Every year since we've started this church, we've read this passage. I think it's so important. It's Moses speaking to the families of Israel. It's found in the ancient book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. And here's how he begins. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Verse 5, Love the Lord your God, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Now he's talking to parents. So he says, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along, along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, uh, you put God into the middle of your family every step along the way. So when you're at the beach, you take a moment before they go hitting that beach and you say, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Is this beautiful or what? Yeah. Can't wait to get in? Yeah. Guess who made all this? Your Father in Heaven did this. When you get to a meal and your kids are ready to dive in, say, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're going to thank God for what He has given to us today. And we're going to remember that it all comes from Him. Amen? So He says, impress it on your kids. Put it in the middle of your whole life, right? He says, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them down on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. In other words, put God in the center of who you are as a parent so that it gets into your kid's heart. Amen? Uh, so what are the gifts that we ought to maybe think about giving our children? I just want to give you three of them very, very quick. This is, as I think about some of the things that we did right as a parent, some of the things we did wrong, which is a lot as a parent, uh, I want to get it right. And so here are a couple of things that are just really important that I think that we ought to think about that are worth giving our kids. And here's the first one. is that We ought to give our kids a community worth having. We ought to give our kids a community worth having. Now, here's what I mean. Uh, of course, your family, the little community you, you create inside of your home, that's the starting point. But anybody who has grown up a little bit in their faith realizes that it takes more than your little family unit to create, uh, to create a positive spiritual environment for your kids to grow up in and flourish. You need this thing called the family of God. When Moses spoke in Deuteronomy 6, he doesn't start off by going, uh, Hear, O oh, Shasso's, hear, O oh, Wren's, hear, O oh, Smith family, hear, O oh, Jones family. No, he said, hear, O oh, people of God, Israel. The people of God, literally, Israel. He's saying the community of faith is so important, what you're doing together. So for Lynette and I, very early on, we decided that among the most important things that we would ever do is to create a culture in our family where we were gonna be part of the family of God. Period, end of discussion. Um, you know, I had no idea that Metro was gonna be Metro at that point, but all I know is that my kids were gonna be buried in the family of God. They were gonna be part of the family of God. They were gonna be knee deep in the family of God because why? I wanted other people, listen, I wanted other people heading in the same direction to have the same influence on their life that I had on their life. Does that make sense? And, and it was just critically important. It was a community worth having. Uh, um, if there is one thing that Lynette and I did was 
we decided that we wanted people who valued the word of God to be part of their regular life. Uh, so like in our little home, growing up, we were part of city groups uh, or life groups. We used to call them, we call them city groups now. And uh, I'll admit it, we hand-selected people. We called certain people. We said, we want you to be in our group because we respect you guys. We love you guys. We love how you're parenting. We love how your marriage is going. And we want you to have influence on our life. And we want, we want your kids to have influence on our kids and vice versa, right? We wanted to put people with similar ideas together. We wanted to expose our kids to ideas that would shape their eternity. Amen. And you do realize that's one of the most important things that you do as, as, as a parent is you expose your kids to the proper uh, areas of life that will help flourish their soul. Amen? Now listen to me. Most parents, here's their strategy. Have a good day at school, kids. And we send them off. And we hope that they do a good job raising our kids. Parents, I don't say that to make you feel bad but it is to challenge you that you better figure out what you are exposing your child to because what they are exposed to, they will become in this world. And it is the parent, I'm just a mom, I'm just a dad, I can't determine their friendship. You're right, you cannot choose their, their friendships always in life, but I tell you what, you can choose the environments in which those friendships are found. Yes. What? Yes. Um, here's what the scripture says about getting the right people in our kids' life. It says this, Proverbs 13, 20. Who wants the word of God? Anybody? This is the word of God. It says, walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. Do you want your kid to suffer? No, of course not. You want them to be wise? Yes, of course, right? So here's what I've learned over life. Anything that you did in life, you rarely did alone. Anything good, you rarely did alone. Anything bad, you rarely did alone. When you did something bad, you usually did it with a bad friend. True? And when you did something good, you usually did it with a good friend. So real quick, how many growing up had bad friends? Stupid friends, yeah. Okay, how many were the stupid friend? How many of you were the stupid? Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I thought, yeah. Uh, this is our church, so gosh. Um, Listen, it is essential that we put our kids in the right environment. So I want to make a major announcement. This is so huge, so huge. You, you may want to really pay attention. This is as big as it gets. Parents in the room, listen. This might surprise you. Metro City Church, we have city kids every single week. Yes! What? That's the announcement? Yes! And some of you are like clockwork and get your kids here twice a month. Once a month, we want to build our kids' soul, right? And we have a group of people called City Kids who wants to do that, who want to partner with your little family to, to, to expose them to the things of God week in and week out. Amen? Amen. And it's important that you as parents, um, that you become regular because your kid can't get in the car and drive. He's four years old. He's seven years old. It's up to you to do it, okay? Now listen, other big news is we have this thing called Generation City. Come on. We have Generation City. Come on. And it's for teenagers, high schoolers and middle schoolers. All the details are on the app. But it is imperative that we get our kids around the right environments. I can tell you that our, our kids, um, we, we, we decided very early on, like we would even say to our team around here, if we don't have a good children's church or a good now uh, teen group for my kids, I'm going to go to another church. Because we have to do this. It is that important. So Lynette and I always prioritize. And listen, I'm just telling you, it costs you money. It costs you heartache. It costs you time. It costs you effort. Um, we, we would send our kids to these retreats, to these camps, to mission trips. And it's like, every time you turn around, you're paying for it. But what I'm doing is I'm deciding what, what, what it's going to take to build their soul. Do you follow what I'm saying? So like right now, I got a son in Africa. My middle son is in Africa. Um, and he's serving Christ with this church, with, with people from this church. I think that's worth it. I think that's worth investing into, right? Um, it, it's just important. The other day, I, I don't even know how it came up. I was talking to my youngest son, Isaac, just the other day. And uh, somehow we started talking about alcohol. I, I, don't, I don't remember how we, we started talking about it, but I was kind of doing the dad thing. Like, you know, you know, you better not, you know, get around, you know, you're only 17. You know, I'm, I'm doing the dad thing. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And uh, he just stops me and goes, dad. You don't have to worry about it. We're not into that. My friends aren't into that at all. We're, we're like, we're in the youth group and church and God and Jesus and stuff. I'm like, yes! Boom! I'll take that any day, right? And won't you? 
won't you? Well, that comes from a lifetime of building it into them. Slowly, meticulously, on purpose. Amen? Uh, some of you are obsessed with sports and you want to build that. I think that's great in your kids. But I want to tell you something. Sports will not save their soul. I'm just saying, uh, it, it just won't. God first, everything else second. Get a whole bunch of second in your life, but God first, amen? Um, I know it's weird. I, think, I, I know the world thinks it's weird that church is important, that you give money to the church, you spend time serving. I, I don't think it's weird. I think it's smart. I think it's good, amen? Okay, three people agree. That's wonderful. Okay, here's the second thing. I think we need to create a standard to achieve. Listen, I think we need to create a standard uh, to achieve. Uh, when, when it comes to parenting, what do we want to do for our kids? We, we want them to love the Lord your God. Moses said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. We want our kids to love God all the time, not just part-time, not just when they're at church, not when they're in front of you. When they go out in this world, we want them to love God. Amen? That is the goal. And so we need to raise that as the standard in our life. So how are we going to do that? I can tell you it's not by lowering the standards in your life. Did you know that this is true? If you were to go back into ancient Israel uh, with Jewish people, uh, by the time a kid was 12, they would memorize, listen, they would memorize the Pentateuch. And you go, what's the Pentateuch? It's the first five books of the entire Bible. They're 12 years old. And you're going, I can't get my kid to make the bed. Right? But they got their kid to memorize five books of the Bible. I'm just telling you this. When you set a standard low, guess what you get? Low results. When you set the standard high in your life, guess what you get? You get higher results every single time. Now listen, if you could get your kid to memorize a little bit of the Bible, do you think they could figure out how to make the bed as well? Mm-hmm. Yeah? You guys aren't convinced over here at all. Wow, you guys are ooh, killing me. Um, let me remind you that if you don't expect much from your kids, your kids will not give you much. If you set the standard so low that it's not even worth trying for, you will get nothing out of your kid. You got to do something different. Uh, you got to believe that they are capable of more and they will actually give you more. And so in our family, growing up, I'm just telling you what our family did. We, we, we wanted our kids to know from the, right from when they were born that we were people of the word that this book was going to mean everything to us, that it was going to be the guide for our family that would outlast mom and dad, that mom and dad would fail, but God's word would never fail them if they could somehow learn God's word. So what we did as a family, uh, when Zachary was just about one year old, he was crazy, he was all over, he was just a wild little kid, uh, but we started to settle him down at night and literally started to read God's word age appropriately, got little storybook Bibles, and we started when they were real, real little. And all the way through, we would get the little different Bible books from our little store over here, and we would, we would read as a family. And we, we weren't perfect. Listen, we were not perfect at this, but we tried like crazy. We tried like crazy. And as they got older, we started doing version Bible plans together. We started doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, and now that they're over, older, I got two kids out of the house, two that are almost out of the house. And, and, but I tell you, we still encourage them almost every single day to fill their heart with the word of God. We encourage them all the time to pray and to seek God. As a matter of fact, Lincoln's in Africa right now. As a family, the rest of us, we're praying very specifically a different prayer each day for Lincoln as a family. Because why? We want what is good coming into their life so good comes out of their life. Garbage in, garbage out. But gar good in, good comes out. Amen? Amen. So we want to raise the standard. We want to raise the standard. We want to raise the standard. So that means like when you're talking to your kid, you don't just go, hey, don't you dare get her pregnant. You're 15. Don't you dare. No, what we say is we want to say this. We want to say, hey, what you want to do is you want to live with some sexual ethics in your life so that when you get married, you can build a great family of loyalty and faithfulness toward one another. That you won't be playing these games that prepare you for divorce. That your mind will be pure, your heart will be pure, and that you will be a man of God. That you will lead your kids and you will lead them well. That's raising the standard in their life. Amen? So if you want your kid to be a little bit less self-absorbed and a little bit less selfish in their life, maybe you should lead them by serving in your church. Maybe you should lead them by example. If you want your kid to be a little bit more generous, maybe you should be a little bit more generous with your church and family of God and putting God first in all areas of your life. I'm just saying good in, good out. And as a parent, parent, you gotta figure this out for your kid, amen? You gotta raise the standard. Woo, come on, anybody? Here, here's what I realized along the way. Our goal was not to raise 
the best soccer player, the best basketball player, whatever. I hope you do got the best. I mean, make some money, take me out to Chipotle. It'd be amazing. Um, but I, I tell you, what I wanted to do was I wanted to raise the best witness for Christ. I wanted to raise somebody who would, would shine the light of Christ in a dark world. That's it. That was the goal. I didn't want my kids to blend in. I actually wanted them to stand out. Come on. I didn't want my kids to get along. I wanted them to stand out and be different in this world. And friends, I just think we need to rethink this a little bit. And here's the last thing I think is that you, as a parent, you got to give your kid an example worth following. You got to give your kid an example worth following. Moses said to the people, he says, impress this on your kid. Your kids are not impressed with your hypocrisy, I can tell you that. Right? Uh, kids are weird. They got this fake detector. Like, I smell fake. Somebody faked. Somebody faked. Somebody faked. Somebody farted. Get it? Somebody faked. So, that was lame. Okay. But kids can smell hypocrisy, can't they? They can't have dad saying, do this, do that, be this, be that. I guess, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you who your kids will become. They will not become what you tell them to become. They'll become who you are. They'll become who you are. And you need to raise a standard in your own life and be an example to your children. You gotta figure out how to make this thing called marriage work if you're married. You gotta make this thing called parenthood work and employment work. You gotta figure it out so you can leave an example to your kids that is worth following. And I'm gonna tell you something. Cultural Christianity will immunize your kid to the Christian faith. Here's what I mean. When you get an immunization, my understanding is like you get like a little bit of the virus, right? And you put it in your blood and your body does its magic and you become immune to the whole virus. Is that how it's supposed to work? Yes, is that, yes. It's the same thing with our faith. When you give your kid a little bit of God, they're gonna go, I don't want any of God because it's a joke. When you give your kid a little bit of church life without ever becoming the church, becoming part of the church, serving in the church, building friendships in the church, giving to the church, when you just give them, hey, we gotta go to church, they're gonna think, well, that's a waste of a Sunday morning because they're gonna be immune to all of it because they'll never have it all in what it all means. And when you give them a little bit of holiness, when you give them a little bit of, of, of godliness in their life, but not all of it, when God doesn't actually change you and grow you and make you different and better, then your kid's gonna look at you and go, you're a fake. And this whole thing is a joke. Hasn't changed you, has it, Dad? Hasn't changed you, Mom, has it? And your kid's just gonna walk away. So friends, listen, at some point, we gotta give our kids an example worth following. Amen? Not perfect. We're never gonna be perfect. I'm the farthest thing from perfect. But we have to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our strength, if our kids are ever gonna love God with all of their heart, all of their soul, and all of their strength. Would you agree? Amen. Amen. Let's stand up. Yeah, come on. It's okay, yeah. Let's stand to our feet. I wanna pray for your family today. I wanna pray for your family. We have to live with a sense of purpose in our parenting. Uh, it, it will not happen by accident. Some of you need to even go home today and you need to have a conversation in your home and make some changes. I don't know. Take some steps. So Father, I pray for my friends in this room. God, I pray that your spirit would speak and that we would listen, that we would be humble before you. God, I think I can speak for everybody who is a parent or a grandparent here. We love our kids and we want great things for them. We want greatness from them and for them. So God, help us to be the parents that cultivate that, that grow that, that inspire that. God, help them to see it inside of us. Help it to be real with us so it becomes real to them. Help us to give our faith to our children, God. Even in this room right now, I know that there are some families where there's almost no relationship between the parent and the child. I wanna just pray for you right now. God, I just pray for those people uh, who have it really, really tough. And they look back and they think with so many regrets, they have so many disappointments. It's not how they wanted it or they never planned it this way, but it is what it is. And so I just pray that you would give them wisdom and hope, give them direction 
And that God, I pray for the families in the middle of it right now as they're raising these kids and they got little kids and older kids and they're trying to figure it all out and they got a rebellious kid, they got a good kid, they got an easy one and a hard one. God, I just pray that you would meet these families and give them favor. Show them your presence, God. Help them to lock eyes with you and to follow you and to lead their kids to follow you. Bless them, God. Show them favor. In Jesus' name together we say, amen.